Good evening. Tonight's parak of Tehillim, parak Kuf, is being learned by Elor Nishma, Sar Rivka, Barab Nacham Umindel, Sarah Lam Drash. The parak of Tehillim opens up, Mizmor Latoda, a psalm of thanksgiving. Rashi comments on this that this isn't just any psalm of thanksgiving, but that this is the psalm of thanksgiving. This is the psalm of thanksgiving that was recited whenever a carbon toda was brought in the Beit HaMikdash. So I think it's important to understand, and really to understand the meaning of this part of Tehillim, we have to understand the context in which it was said. So a little bit of background information about the Karban Toda. For starters, the Karban Toda was a carbon that was given whenever someone survived a life-threatening situation. It was pretty much like the Berkas HaGomel equivalent of its day. And what was offered itself was you offered a cow, goat, or sheep, 20 matzahs and 10 loaves of bread. So what's interesting though about this carbon is that only one tenth of the carbon was actually eaten by the Kohen. The other nine tenths were supposed to be eaten by the person who was giving it and within uh, 24 hours of when he brings the carbon. So I don't know how many of you ever tried to eat nine tenths of a cow, especially within 24 hours, but it's not exactly an easy feat to handle. And it seems a lot to expect of the person. So the Nativ comments on this, and he says that we see, based on the fact that Hashem commands us to bring so much with the carbon Toda, that this is a carbon that is meant to be given in front of as many people as possible. You should invite your friends, your neighbors, your family, whoever possible, to see your carbon Toda in order to show to the world, to express to the world how thankful you are to Hashem, how happy you are that Hashem decided to save you and how much Hashem loves you and how much Hashem cares for his people and how much he does for us on a daily basis and to show our appreciation in front of as many people as possible. So I think it's important to keep in mind while learning the rest of this parak of Tehillim that this is a type of thanks that isn't supposed to be private. This is a type of thanks that we're supposed to be screaming to the rooftops in front of as many people as possible how much we love and how proud we are of Hashem. So as we look at the rest of this Pasuk, at the first Pasuk, we see Mizmo Latoda Hariu Hashem Kol Aret, the Psalm of Thanksgiving, Kol Atu Hashem, everyone on earth. So I think this fits very well with this idea that this is supposed to be something that we're thinking Hashem in front of as many people as possible. The whole world in reaction should be calling out in praise because they should see just how much, just how thankful we are to Hashem and just how great Hashem is. And that should cause them to want to sing out Hashem's praises. So now I'm going to look at the second par- second Pasuk in this Parak of Tehillim. And this is the Pasuk that I'm going to spend the majority of my time discussing, probably the most famous Pasuk in this Parak. So the second Pasuk goes, Ibdu et Hashem b'simcha bo l'fana b'rnana. Serve Hashem with gladness, come before Him with joyous song. So before I actually discuss what this means to serve Hashem with gladness, I think it's important to realize that this isn't just a piece of advice that David is giving us here. According to some Rishonim, including Rabbeinu Bachya, this is actually a chiyav min Torah. He's representing a chiyav that we have to serve Hashem with, um, with happiness. And where does he get this from? He gets this from um, in Parshas Kitavo, actually. The Pasuk says, Tachat eshelo avarta et Hashem alokecha b'simcha b'tuv levav meirov kol, v'avarta et avarcha asher shalchanu Hashem b'cha b'rav b'tzama b'eiro m'chomser kol notin ol barza al t'varacha adi shmidu otach. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with happiness and with gladness of heart when you had an abundance of everything, therefore you will serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you when you are in famine, thirst, destitution, and lacking everything, and you will place an iron yoke upon your neck until he has destroyed you. So in summary, what these Sikhmah are saying, because of the fact that Hashem, that B'nai Israel didn't serve Hashem with happiness when Hashem had provided them with everything that they needed, now, when they have nothing, they will be forced to serve their enemies. So Rabbeinu Bachya, he says, not only is this a chiyav that we have to serve Hashem with happiness, but the chiyav that if you do not do it, that you will be punished. You will actually be punished for not serving Hashem with happiness. So I think I want to discuss three main questions that I have on this idea. The first question that I have is that it seems pretty harsh to punish Bnei Yisrael for not serving Hashem with happiness. I mean, if you look at the typical servant-king relationship, what do we expect of a servant? We expect him to do his job with alacrity. We expect him to do it efficiently. We don't necessarily expect our servants to serve, our, to serve their master with happiness. 
I mean, it would be nice, but it's not necessarily fair to expect them when they're serving God to, to I mean, sorry, when they're serving their master to be doing it with a sense of joy. I mean, it seems it's hard to force an emotion on a person. Okay, that's the first question. The second question I want to address is how exactly does this serving God with happiness relate to the overall topic of being thankful towards God? And the last question I want to address is probably the most important question is how exactly do we implement this into our daily lives? How do we make it so that we are constantly serving Hashem with happiness? Okay, let's get started. So Rav David Feinstein on his commentary on Parshas Kitavo, he, he makes a comment that what exactly is it that B'nai Yisrael are being punished for here? It's not necessarily that they weren't serving God with happiness. That wasn't the issue. The issue is what did it signify that they weren't serving Hashem with happiness? What does it show about their attitude and their relationship towards Hashem? So he comments that if you look at the actual words of the Pesukim, I think you can get a sense of their problem, their, their issue. What didn't they do? They didn't serve Hashem with happiness and with gladness of heart when they had an abundance of everything. So he focuses most specifically on the words Merov Kol, with an abundance of everything when they had that. So what does this remind? Rabbi David Feinstein says this reminds him of if you look at the situation of Yaakov and Esau. When Esau was trying to brag about how much he had to Yaakov, he says, Yeshli Rav, I have an abundance. I have so much. And I have so much. And when, in comparison, when Yaakov was asked what he had, he says, Yeshli Kol. Yaakov, through much of his time period, had much less than Esau did, but yet he still felt that he had everything. He had all. So that's the big difference here. Someone who has Rav, yes, you can feel that he has a lot. You can feel happy. But Esau felt like they had Rav. They didn't deny that Hashem was supplying them. But they didn't feel satisfied. They didn't feel like they had enough. They felt like there always could have been more. They weren't getting it. What exactly B'nai Israel didn't understand will be understood in our interpretation on the next Pasuk of this Parak of Talim. Look at the next Pasuk, it says, Do ki Hashem hu elokim hu asanam lo anachnu amom b'tzon marito. Know that Hashem, he is God, it is he who has made us, and we are his, his people, and the sheep of his pasture. There's a Kriyuch chsev on this Pasuk that says, if you look at the words, below on hu asanam b'lo anachnu, he made us, and we are his. Below can either be read as below meaning his or below meaning Lam and Aleph and we are not. So what do we learn based on this? Minchas Shai says that we learn that Hashem, we because Hashem made us, we are his. But if Hashem had not made us, we would not be. Now this is obvious. Why does the Minchas Shai need to say this? But he's saying it's not only in the physical sense that we wouldn't be here if God hadn't created us. But the whole idea is that if there was no God, there would be no purpose to Am Yisrael. B'nai Yisrael are only here for the serv- purpose of serving God. B'nai Yisrael should never have felt lacking because, every, of course, Hashem gi- gives us everything that we need in order to serve Him. Everything that I personally need to serve Hashem, of course, Hashem is going to hand that to them. They felt that they themselves, personally, what they wanted for themselves, not necessarily for the servants of Hashem, that was what they felt the lacking in. That is what they didn't think that they had enough of. And the fact is you have to realize that whatever I have, whatever I personally have, it's always going to be enough because Hashem created us. God is our creator. God, God supplies us, therefore, with everything that we need. He knows our tough gut ahead of time. He knows what we personally are meant to um, accomplish in this world, and that is what he gives us. Another way also to look at this pasuk based on this kreyuchsim is the fact that based on, Hashem, that based on the fact that Hashem created us, we are his. We belong to him. And B'nai Israel should have felt a sense of security. The fact that Hashem created us and that he loves us and that he's watching out for us, we should never feel like we don't have enough of everything because Hashem's always going to be there to provide for us. We should never feel that we're not going to have enough of what we need because Hashem's always going to be there to provide for us and give us what we need. So Rav Zev left on one of his shirim on the Parsha. I think gives an insight into another way that we can look at what it means to be Ifti Wat Hashem Simcha and how specifically it relates to being thankful towards God. So Rav Zevlov actually comments on Shavuot, comments on the on Rus. And he says if you look at Rus as a character, it's obvious that she is a Tzadikas. 
obvious that she found God, she stayed with Naomi, she was Zohar to have David Amalek be her great grandson. She was clearly someone who we should look up to with a lot of esteem, a lot of praise. And yet, when you look at the story, it seems that everything that she went through was degrading. He practically had to beg at the feet of Boaz just so that she could have enough to eat for herself and for her mother-in-law. Why couldn't God have just supported her and given her everything that she needed during this time period? So I've left comments and he says that what you're not understanding is that this wasn't all, that what Rus had to go through in begging Boaz for food wasn't for her sake, it was for Boaz. The whole situation here was set up so that he would have, have the opportunity to be able to give tzedakah, that he would have be zocha to give tzedakah to someone as amazing as Rus. So Chazal, they tell us that one who gives tzedakah, that the mitzvah of giving tzedakah is more important for the one who is giving than the one who is receiving. Why is this? Because Giving tzedakah is an opportunity for us. It's something that changes us. It makes us into a giver. It allows us to live B'tzal Malakim and allows us to be a partner in creation in a way that we are giving in the same way that God gives. And we get to experience a little bit of what it's like to be God when we give tzedakah. One of the things that we know about tzedakah is that it's not considered the same level of a mitzvah if you do not give happily. Why is that? Because it's not something, if you give, if you're someone who's giving when you're don't want to give, if you're giving upset about it, and you're just opening your wallet because you have to, you're not becoming a giver. You're not becoming someone who loves to give. You're not becoming like God. What you're becoming is a stingy person who's forced to open his wallet. It's not something, if you don't want yourself to be changed, if you don't allow yourself to be changed, if you don't embrace it, then you're not going to be affected. And I think that we can apply this idea to almost any mitzvah, to any type of serving of God. If we're not doing it in a way that we want to be affected by it. Hashem doesn't need our serving. Hashem, just like he could provide for all the Aniyam, he could do all these things by himself. He doesn't need our tefillos. He doesn't need our mitzvos. He doesn't need all these things. These things are here for us. They're here to change us. They're here to help us grow. And if we don't open ourselves up to that, if we don't come at it with a happiness and with an excitement, then it's not going to affect us. It's not going to change us. I think it's just an important thing to keep in mind. So now I would like to address my final and probably most important question on this parak of Tehillim, which is how do we implement this into our lives? How do we become people who serve Hashem with happiness? So for this, I would like to look at Rav Hirsch's interpretation on this parak of Tehillim. He says, pretty much, if you're asking this question and you're not getting this parak of Tehillim, if do it Hashem, serve Hashem, besimcha, then you will be besimcha. By nature of the fact that you are someone who is serving Hashem, then you are going to be a person who lives B'Simcha. So how is this possible? Why is that? He says, for this, you have to understand what exactly it means to be someone who is Ibdu with Hashem, someone who serves Hashem. A servant is someone who dedicates their whole life and essence and being to pleasing their master, to doing what their master wants in this world. It's not just when they're doing their task and then at the end of the day, they go off and do whatever they want for themselves. No, it's a state of being, it's a state of mind. Every chance that they have to do something in a way that can please their master, they do it. Whether they're on duty, whether they're off duty, whatever it is, it's always in the back of their head, they're doing this for the, for the sake of their master. And in the same way, what Rav Hirsch is saying is that it's not serving Hashem in the way that we think of, which is davening three times a day and doing mitzvot and things. Those are all very nice. This means like in our everyday activities, when we're doing things that we love to do, when we're doing things for enjoyment, when we're doing things in any type of way, we should always be doing it with the thought process of, and how can I direct this to God? How can I make this something kadosh? How can I do this in a way that Hashem would be proud of me? How can I do this? Especially, how can I do this in a way that fulfills the tafkid of the Jewish people? And I would like to connect this whole idea of Rav Hirsch's back to my original point, my first point that I made in this year with a story that I heard from President Joel at one of the YU graduations a couple of years back. And he tells the story of this father who comes home from work and he sees his little girls working on some art project. 
and she has out her construction paper and her crayons and her markers and her glitter glue and the whole bit. She's like totally involved in this, whatever she's working on. He comes over to her and he's like, he's like interested because she seems so set on what she's doing. And he says to her, what are you making? She's like, oh, a picture. And so we asked her, oh, of what? She said, oh, God. He says, and it's like a little awkward. And he's like, uh, sweetie, I don't know how to tell you this, but no one exactly knows what God looks like. And then she says, oh, don't worry. They will when I'm done. And I mean, it's cute. It's a cute story, but I think that there's a message here is that this girl has it right. Our job as Jews, our whole tough kid in this world is to be an Orla Gayim. We're supposed to show the world the MS and what Hashem does for us. We're supposed to be displaying this to the world. And the world doesn't always see it in our, necessarily in our mitzvot. And the world doesn't necessarily see it in our tefillos. It's important for us in the way that we hold ourselves and the way that we act and the way that we are, that we're showing that everything behind us is driven by God. And we all know people who are like this, who are people who are completely driven in everything that they do by God. And it shows. Everyone in the world knows it, whether they're talking about it or not. It's just so clear on their expression. It's so clear in the way they act because these are people who are changed by it. These are people who are living the simcha. You could see it in the way they feel. They feel connected. They feel at peace. They feel like what they're doing is right. And my hope is that we should all accomplish to be at this level. Thank you very much.